So the, the scale of human cooperation is really quite puzzling from a biological point of view. I mean, when we look elsewhere in the natural world, when we look at ants or amoebas or meerkats or baboons uh, or chimpanzees, you know, what we find is that cooperation tends to be restricted to relatively small groups. Those groups are formed of genetic relatives. And in some sense, they help each other because they're genetic relatives, you know, because they share genes. That shared genetic interest in the future is what leads natural selection to favor helping behavior within these groups. And we see this pattern right across the natural world until we get to humans. You know, humans don't just cooperate in small groups formed of close relatives and then behave aggressively uh, with hostility to individuals in other groups. Instead, we find very, very large-scale societies. Um, this isn't even a, a recent phenomenon, that it really seems to, you know, even in human prehistory, before nation-states as we know it, before governments, before societies of millions of people, there were still tribal groups. You know, tribal groups of maybe 500 to 1,000 individuals. You know, and they weren't composed of close genetic relatives. This was about cooperation on a very large scale, involving individuals who, who would have barely known each other, who would have been essentially strangers to each other, nevertheless acting cooperatively, helping each other, at the very least uh, interacting non-aggressively when they met and recognized each other as members of the same tribe. And this really bucks the trend across the rest of the natural world and leaves evolutionary theorists you know, scratching their heads for an explanation. But what is it that explains cooperation in large groups of genetic non-relatives? It's not kin selection as we know it in the ordinary sense. So what is it? I mean, my strong suspicion, and a suspicion that I share with, with a lot of you know, evolutionary anthropologists working in this area, is that the key to understanding human cooperation is cultural evolution. Not genetic evolution, but cultural evolution. Where cultural evolution is like genetic evolution, in that you have processes a bit like natural selection, processes that are a bit Darwinian at work, favoring some variants over others. But the units here, not genes. It's not genes that are being selected. It's beliefs, values, skills, representations in people's heads, what are often called cultural variants. They don't have to be memes. Uh, the concept of, of, of a meme from Richard Dawkins is a famous way of understanding uh, cultural evolution on which the units of cultural transmission and learning are taken to be very much like genes and that they're taken to be little particles that are transmitted by themselves with high fidelity. It doesn't have to work exactly like that. You know, we can be talking here about beliefs, values, skills um, that kind of blend when, you know, you learn from many, many individuals. What you inherit is a kind of blend of their beliefs, values, and skills, not just a meme, you know. But the thought is that even if cultural inheritance is a bit of a mess in that sense, it's kind of blending inheritance rather than all about memes, there can still be interesting analogies to be drawn between processes of cultural change and processes of genetic evolution. And that these processes of cultural evolution are what lead to out, a, a kind of altruism in humans that we just don't see in chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. I mean, chimpanzees live in small groups. In general, when they encounter individuals from other groups, those interactions are very, very hostile. They'll quite happily, given the chance, kill a, a, a chimpanzee from a rival group who strays into their territory. This is why chimpanzees don't really have tribes to speak of. They don't cooperate with non-relatives in the right kind of way. So what... How do we go about building a theory of cultural evolution that will help us explain human altruism? What should the core principles of that theory be? 
Well, I think a very good place to look is actually the theory of kin selection or inclusive fitness. What is really, I think, our best current theory of how altruism evolves by genetic evolution. I think we should be looking at that theory and trying to think of ways in which we can take the core principles of that theory and apply them to the cultural case. Now, the core principle of the th theory of kin selection is a principle known as Hamilton's rule. This principle that says altruistic behaviors are favored by natural selection when RB is greater than C, where C is the cost to the individual who performs the altruistic behavior measured in the currency of reproductive success. B is the benefit that that organism confers on another one by virtue of its altruistic behavior. And R is what's known as the coefficient of relatedness, a measure of the genetic resemblance between the two organisms involved. So if you think of ants, you know, the idea is that the workers help the queen because R is positive, the workers are related to the queen, and B, RB outweighs C. The cost the ants incur by helping the queen is outweighed by the benefit times R that they confer on the queen. And I think we should be looking for ways to transpose that insight across to the case of human cultural evolution. Now that means we have to think about the key terms quite differently. It means that instead of thinking about a coefficient of genetic relatedness, we need to be thinking about a coefficient of cultural relatedness. Where cultural relatedness is not about the genetic similarity between you and the person you're helping, but rather about the cultural similarity, your tendency to share beliefs, values, skills with that potential beneficiary. The basic idea is the same, that you have an incentive to help those individuals who share the transmissible basis of the behavior you're performing. All we're doing is saying that instead of the behavior being genes, uh, based in genes, the behavior is based in beliefs, values, skills, and so on. Now that's a kind of basic idea. It leaves a lot of questions unanswered. It leaves a lot of complications about how we flesh out the details uh, about how to apply Hamilton's insights from the genetic case in the cultural case. Now, I don't have time to go into all of those details here. I'll just say that I think this is an area in which anthropologists can actually learn quite a lot from microbiologists. People studying humans can learn quite a lot from people studying bacteria. And the reason for this is that despite all of the obvious differences between humans and bacteria, you know, we don't split in half every 20 minutes, uh, they don't have institutions, religions, states, and so on. In spite of all of that, you know, there's a very important similarity. And that similarity is horizontal transmission. What I mean by that is that bacteria trade genes with each other. When they meet in natural populations, sometimes they touch, they conjugate, and little packets of DNA called plasmids can move from one bacterium to another. So genetic material starts off in one bacterium, ends up in another, replicates uh, through cell-to-cell -cell contact. And so these bacteria end up sharing genes with each other that they didn't share before. And so we have here a conception of how it can be that two organisms can come to resemble each other genetically, not because they're actually close relatives, but because they've engaged in a process, a contact process, that led to horizontal transmission of genes from one to the other. And this, I think, resembles in interesting ways the process of social learning, where humans don't simply have the beliefs, values, skills they got off their parents, but actually meet with each other in social situations and learn from each other socially. Now, these processes, of course, are very different, but there is a sense in which humans, after hundreds of millions of years of evolution in between, have rediscovered 
horizontal transmission. We've rediscovered a way of transmitting uh, to each other, not through the parent's offspring channel, but through other channels. And what I think is that we can gain some insight into how social learning affects the dynamics of cultural evolution in humans by looking at how horizontal transmission affects the dynamics of genetic evolution in bacteria. So this is why, for all the differences, I think anthropologists and microbiologists should be working closely together to develop a deeper understanding of how it is that horizontal transmission fundamentally changes the dynamics of evolution and creates new ways for altruism between genetic non-relatives to evolve.